certainly a good opportunity to be able to come and see the good brethren here in this congregation. I've got uh, a couple of uh, really good memories uh, from here, uh, from when I was in the school of preaching. I sat right over here during the uh, Truth and Love lectures, and, um, and one year, I think it was the second year I was here, Brother Taylor was up here preaching, and you know, if you know Brother Taylor, uh, Robert Taylor Jr., he basically just put his hands up here, and he he made a hand gesture, and uh, I remember that being really funny because he never did anything, and then somebody pointed out, I guess it was Brother Sane, pointed it out and said, he, he made a hand gesture, and then Brother, Brother Taylor said, said, now I'm exhausted, and uh, I, uh, I remember um, that lectureship very well. I'm thankful for the opportunity to get up here and be able to preach. I'm not going to waste time by uh, talking about other things. Let's get right into the Word of God. I want to talk about something that I think is very important to all of us, and it's just this one simple idea. You know, if you look at Genesis chapter 6, and we're not going to spend any time really there, but I want to make mention of one thing. In Genesis chapter 6, the, uh, the thought given by the Holy Spirit is that the people in that day and time it says that their thoughts were only evil continually. And we know that we can have good thoughts and we can have bad thoughts. And, and uh, maybe you have a translation that says that the imaginations of their hearts were only wicked continually. And that, uh, I think, is uh, a, a good example of how people can use their imaginations for wickedness. But we can use our imaginations for something good as well. And I want all of us to think about that tonight as we go throughout this lesson. I want you to ask yourself this question. I'll be asking myself throughout this whole sermon. I want you to ask the same question. And that is, what if everyone in the church were just like me? Just think about that. Answer that question for each thought process tonight. Let's look at a few things here. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verses, uh, or 1 Thessalonians 1, verses 5 to 9, For our gospel did not come to you, and word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit, and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. And from you the word of the Lord was sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out, so that we do not need to say anything, for they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Now, they were good examples. The question that we need to ask ourselves, are we good examples in these things? Of course, in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, we see that we need to, yeah, that uh, just as, as Paul wrote, imitate me, just all, as I also imitate Christ. I need to be a good example, but I don't, you know what, I don't need to copy somebody else if they're not being a good example. You know, that oftentimes is the case. Uh, I have heard of people who got pulled over for speeding tickets and they got so upset with that police officer because they would say something like, you know that guy that passed me just a little while ago, he was going faster than me. Why did you pull me over for speeding? You know, upset. Upset because he got caught. But he's pointing out to somebody else. They weren't a good example. They weren't somebody to follow. And what is he doing? He's following in their example. But let's think about some things tonight. Number one is this. If everyone in the church were just like me, what would attendance be like? We have a pretty good crowd here tonight. I know that there are some that are visitors. I'm not normally here, so I don't know who is normally here. Uh, but this is a decent-sized crowd. That's good. I'm glad to see that. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of people that I know that you know that they're just not here. And you're sitting here thinking about somebody right now as I'm mentioning this and thinking, you know what, they aren't here. They were here this morning, or maybe they haven't been here in weeks, whatever the case. But what if everyone in the church were just like me when it came to attendance? In Hebrews 10, chapter, uh, chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, it says, 
and let us consider unto one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. We are to come together and we are to encourage each other, but there are some who will not do that. Well, how is my attendance? You know, I, I need to ask myself that question, that how is my attendance? Am I trying to do everything that I can? Because, you know, I have heard people say, you know what, the church is doing too much sometimes. You know, they'll, they'll say, well, you know, we come and we have Bible class on Sunday morning and then we have worship and then, then we come back for worship Sunday night and then, you know, we have Wednesday night services. And then if you look, there's other things that are being done in the congregation. Maybe have a ladies' night or a men's night or something, something extra. And uh, I know that when I worked with the church and you know, I was a youth minister that sometimes people would say, you know, we're doing too much. We're doing too much. And, and I uh, was studying my Bible at that time, pretty new in, in some manners. And, and I just simply uh, told them, you know what, you really wouldn't have liked it in the first century. Because when you look at Acts chapter 2, what were they doing? They were coming together daily. We should want to be with our brethren. And you know what, when it comes to attendance to services, we need to be there. You know what, if there's a gospel meeting, we need to be there. We need to be there. When the doors are open, we need to be there. Because we are trying to show not only a good example to those around us, we are trying to learn as well, and we're trying to encourage each other. Now, how is my attendance? Can I be counted on at worship? You know, sometimes I know that there are, are times... Uh, when people come in and they're supposed to be serving in some capacity, and then next thing you know, the guy that's getting everything together has to go and scramble for maybe a prayer or a song leader or something. Why? Because somebody dropped the ball. They weren't there. And where should they have been? Well, you know, there are some circumstances, I'm assuming, you know, sickness or something like that. But what would the church be like if everyone in the church were just like me, would we have to make sure that we were building on to the building because we didn't have enough room to sit everybody because everybody that was converted to Christ was going to be there all the time? What, what would it be like? Number two, let's think about this. What if everyone in the church were just like me when it came to worshiping God? Now, we know John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24, it says, But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. And now the verse that we all know by heart, right? God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship how? In spirit and truth. So we need to have the right attitude. We need to do it in truth. We need to do it the right way. Those things are immensely important. But I've got to make mention of this while we're talking about John 4 and verse 24. I believe that the religious world has uh, uh, gotten this really wrong. And I, I mean this by and large. Because you look, and there are people who have that spirit aspect down. They, they, they say they love God. Now, they're not doing the things that you see in the scriptures, but they, they're like, uh, yeah, I love God. I believe in God, and, and they'll tell you that all day long. They'll go and tell their friends, and they're attending some denomination. They're going to do that, and they, when they worship God, they do it in spirit, but they don't do it in truth. Now, then there's another group of people, and these tend to be brethren a lot of times, and that is that what they do is they know they know how charismatic things can get and so they go i'm not i'm not going to do that we know that these denominations are doing something wrong and so we're going to worship god and we're going to do it in truth and they teach the truth and they worship in truth but they forget the spirit aspect brethren i know that we do this when we go over to mark 16 and verse 16 what do we do he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved we know that equation one plus one equals two, right? You have to have both of those things together. When you see that word and in a word problem, you know that you have to add it together. So when we worship God, how do we do it? We do it in spirit and 
in truth, we cannot leave out one or the other. We have to have both of them together. Now, what does that look like when we come together and worship God? Well, it means that when we come together and worship God, we are doing it not only the right way, but we're doing it in such a way that it is pleasing to God because our attitude is right with God. You know what? We're singing out, and we are, uh, we are thinking about the words that we're singing, and we are doing everything that we can to keep our minds focused on what we're doing, and that is worshiping God. Now, I know. I, I, I didn't... <laughs> Look, the singing's great tonight. You know, I can I hear people singing out, and I'm assuming you're singing out with your heart, and I'm very thankful for that. There may be somebody in this room who thinks, you know what, I can't sing. And because I can't sing, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do anything. And so, you know, you, you might see this person, this person when they're singing, they're just basically mumbling. They're not singing out. That's, that's not what we ought to be doing. We need to be singing out to God. We're putting everything, we're putting that our, all of our attitude into worshiping God. We have the correct attitude, and we're doing it the right way. And so that means that we're actually going to have to sing out and do things. That when we're singing out our songs of praise to God, that we're thinking about Him. And it doesn't matter if you can carry a tune in a bucket or not. I know that um, uh, I've preached for a congregation where there's a big emphasis that was put on singing. So much, in fact, that I believe it got to a point where it was just wrong. And the idea was, let's just make sure it sounds good. They wanted it to sound good, and that's all they did. And you know what? I, I, I would have to get up from time to time and mention, you know what? We want to do everything to the best of our ability but this is really a whole lot more about the attitude and not about the quality. Why? If it's about the quality, then I'm going to guarantee you there's at least a couple of people in here whose worship would have been subpar because they can't sing as well. But that's not the point. The point is that we worship God and we are putting our efforts into praising Him. It's about an action of the heart. And so... We sing out, and we, we just sing with our hearts here to the Lord. I, I think about a, a man that uh, I used to uh, worship with for a few years, and uh, he, was a, he was a really good man, and he really, he was a, a good Bible student. He would teach, and he would preach, and you know what? If nobody else was around, he would lead singing, and, and the man was... And, well, he just really could not carry a tune in a bucket. But you know what the thing was? Is everybody loved standing around that man when it came to singing. Because you know what he was doing? He was singing from his heart. That's what we all need to be doing. Singing from our heart. You know, uh, in Matthew 15 and verse 9, we see something very important. And that is, it says... And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And of course, this is wrong for, you know, uh, this main purpose of teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. We don't need to teach the commandments of men. We teach the commandments of God and it only. That's it. But, you know, the, the, the other thing here that I, I want to point out to everyone here is something very simple. And that is that indeed... You can worship in vain. Now, what does that mean? I know that growing up that um, my, uh, my mom listened to all kinds of music, and I know one song that kept repeating, uh, you, know, from, you know, from time to time, we'd get on a kick and listen to this song, and that was, you're so vain, right? You're so vain, you probably think this song is about you. And we would hear that. And uh, I had no clue what that meant. I don't know. Uh, I don't even listen to that song today. I just know that that's what they say. But uh, the word vain, what does that mean? Is that, does that mean that you're full of yourself? Well, the word vain means empty or worthless. Now, I've got to ask you a question when it comes to worship. We could make all kinds of application, but we're not going to have the time to do that tonight. But... When we're worshiping God, do you want your worship to be in vain? 
Do you want your worship to be in vain? No, no, you don't. Then what do we need to do? We need to worship God in spirit and in truth. Am I listening to the prayers? Am I keeping my mind set on the Lord's Supper? When the preaching is going on, am I listening? Maybe I'm taking notes. What, what is going on? How am I worshiping God? If everyone in the church were just like me, what would worship be like? Let's think about the next one, number three. What if everyone in the church were just like me concerning giving? Now, I've actually been a part of congregations where they said the preacher should not ever preach on giving. And it was like it was some kind of a um, uh, problem, uh, some kind of a dual standard or whatnot. You know, maybe he's trying to pad his pocket. And I'm telling you what, that is not what the preacher thinks about when he's doing that. He doesn't get to decide, oh, I'm going to make more money this week. And so that's, that's what we're going to do. No, that's not, that's not what's going on. What we need to do, though, is we need to be obedient to God in what the standard is for giving. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, it says, But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly, or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. So what are we going to do? We're going we're to give as we have been prospered, and we're going to do that how? With a cheerful heart. We're going to do it happily. It's, it's, not, it's not something that it's just a necessity. It's not just an obligation. It's something that we want to do. We want to give to God. Now, we've got to be careful in a couple of different realms. I think number one is, you know, if you purpose to give a certain amount, which I think most of us do, right, then you need to not do that just automatically. You need to be thinking about what's going on, that you are giving to God. Yeah, sure, you know, you know exactly how much you're going to give, but you, but you purpose that every single time, and you think about how happy you are to do it. But we know that sometimes this is a, a sticky situation for brethren. I'll tell you what, I, I, I'm going to be right up front with you. When I was a young man, and I had uh, uh, become a, a Christian, I started working with the church. I, I really didn't know this subject very well, and so I ended up doing some things that I oftentimes preach against, and that is the one big thing that I preach against a lot in this area is the fact that there are some people who just don't purpose at all. And that was me in the beginning of my walk as a Christian. Maybe many of you are in the same boat. And uh, I don't know what you did, but I did this. And that is Sunday would come, and I'd open up my wallet, and I would see what was left, and I would give from what was left. Do you think that's pleasing to God? No. No, it's not pleasing to God. Why? Because God, you know, you, there, you go into the Old Testament, you look at all these examples of first fruit giving. What does that mean? Before you do anything else, you give off the top. You don't give God the leftovers. How disgraceful is that? My father-in-law is a preacher, and, and he will uh, tell a story about uh, in the same thought process, and and he says, you go over uh, to someone's house, and they're going to have this big meal, and, and you just, oh, man, you come in, and there's just all of your favorite things just sitting out on that table, and you're just, and you're hungry. You haven't eaten in hours. You've been waiting for this moment, kind of like Thanksgiving. You wait all day, and you're ready to eat, right? And so this person uh, that you've gone over to their house, they've got this beautiful spread of food. It looks great, and you can't wait to dig in. And they said, you know what, we've got a tradition in our family. And next thing you know, they, they call in Beethoven. Beethoven jumps up on that, that table and starts eating the food. And so we let our dog eat first. Now, think about that for a second. Would you, would you want to eat after a dog? Would you want to do that? You know, you look at all that beautiful food and then all of a sudden... There's dog hair all over it. And there's slobber everywhere. That, that, I hope you're disgusted by that. That's gross. And then they're like, all right, now we can eat. What are you going to do? You're like, uh, no, thank you. I, no, thank you. I'm not doing that. You have picked the wrong house guest. 
we're going to go down the street. Taco Bell is better than this any day of the week. And that's what you do. You leave and that's it. Now, that, in essence, is what people do to God. Now, you give God the leftovers. You don't let your dog get up on the table. You give your dog the leftovers. Your dog doesn't get first choice. You give your dog the leftovers. We don't need to treat God like a dog and give him the leftovers. In Ephesians chapter 4, and verse 28, it says, Let him who stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who is in need. You know, uh, this, is, this is the thing. When we are thinking about giving, you know, we also need to give not only to God, but give to others. Let him that stole steal no more, but let him give. Let him give to those that have need. Give to someone in need. But oftentimes, we don't think about that first and foremost, do we? You know what we tend to do? And maybe this is uh, extravagant, but maybe we go, you know what? I really like that new bass boat. And man, I'm going to go get that. You know, I'm, I may not have a whole bunch of money left over after that, but man, I'm going to have some fun on that bass boat. Or we go and we buy the nice expensive car, the nice expensive house, and we do all these things, and then we have barely le anything left over. Even if we did, you know, we, even if we're giving really well to God, we've got that down, we're still missing a factor here in being able to give to others. We need to be generous people. And our attitude toward working and getting monetary gain is not necessarily for ourselves. We pay for the things that are necessary in life, the essentials, but then we also need to be able to give to others. And I'll tell you what, um, if you've ever read stuff from Dave Ramsey, I think that's probably one of the coolest things that he talks about. Not even a member of the church. You know what he does? He says, you need to get out of debt. You need to save up all this money. You pay off your mortgage. You do all these things, and then you invest. And then after you invest, you get to do the best part, and that is be generous to others. Have you ever had someone generous to you, give you something of great value, maybe help you out when you're in a bad spot, and you think, man, I want to repay someone else one day. And if we are not the kind of people that are willing to give and have that good heart to give, then we're never going to be those people. In 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 5, it says this, And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. I want to make a couple of points here on this passage, and that's very simply the first thing that they did, what? They gave of themselves. Now, I want to make sure that people understand this in its context. They gave of themselves. It doesn't mean that they didn't give monetarily as well. They gave of their time. They gave of their efforts. That's what they did. They, they gave in the work of the church. They also gave in the, the aspect of giving to the uh, apostles and in in their work. But you know what, what is going on here is I've seen people take this verse and they'll say, well, see, I, you know, I give of myself. And therefore, I don't need to give monetarily. And that's what I'm going to do. And you know the people that I've actually heard say that? They, they've told me this. They've said, well, you know what? We give of ourselves. We don't give monetarily, but we give of ourselves. And you want to know the reality of it? They didn't give very much of themselves. Brethren, this doesn't give us an out of monetary giving. This just gives us an extra example as to what we ought to do. Yeah, we're going to give of our money, but we're going to give of our time. We're going to give of ourselves to the work of the church. That's what we're going to do. If everyone in the church were just like me, what would giving be like? Would, would we be concerned about where we're going to be able to put all this money because we've got way too much We've got way too much for this congregation. We're going to have to find somebody else to give some of this to. We're going to have to find some good work to be a part of because we've got so much coming in, we don't know what to do with it. What would that be like? All right. 
Number four, what if everyone in the church were like me when it came to evangelism? Now, there's several things that I'd like to say here, but the very first thing that I want you to ask, I want you to ask yourself this question. If everybody in the church were just like me when it came to evangelism, would I be saved? I mean, think about it. Somebody talked to you about the gospel of Christ one day. You listened, you heard it, and then you obeyed the gospel. But what would have happened if that person wasn't there? What if they weren't there to tell you anything? If everybody in the church were just like me concerning evangelism, would I be a Christian? I think the sad fact for many is that they would not. And this is, this is not good, brethren. This is not good. What we need to do is we need to have a love for souls. In Jude 15 and 22 and 23, it says this respectively. It says, To execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Now, you skip down to verse 22 and 23, it says this, And on some have compassion, making a distinction, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. You don't want any part of it. You know, and, and, and you've seen this before. Sometimes you make a, a distinction between people, and you're gentle, and you, and you just you know, keep teaching, and you keep teaching, and you bring them closer and closer until one day you get them. But other people, what do you do? You tell them, look. And I know this, for some reason, is not um, uh, very popular today, but I think it's very effective and I'm not sure why people don't uh, think this way. They think that they're going to offend people. And that is that if you see somebody and they're in sin, what do you do? You go and tell them. I mean, you think about 1 Corinthians 5 and Matthew 18 and, and going to somebody who's in sin and trying to bring them back from the brink. We've got to do that. But and, and I said, that, that's not supposed to be different. That's what we're all supposed to do. We're supposed to support everything that we do with the Scriptures. And it's a sad fact, though, that there are many people out there, and maybe even many brethren, that uh, don't understand this. Now, you see this blessed man, and he is, he is pouring over the Word of God both day and night. Now, um, I'm sure that many of you who have uh, lived uh, longer than I have, you know, I grew up in, um, in a time where computers became a big thing, and, and uh, I know that the year I went into sixth grade, they switched from typewriters for your typing class to keyboards and computers for now a keyboarding class, and we were, we were being taught computers. And so, you know, look, we, we, we did all this. We, in, we enjoyed that, and, and I, I appreciated it. But, um, you know, before there was email, you know, there was a, a thing called the phone. Even before that, you know, there was a thing that you, you know, there, were, there was a time, and I'm young people, there was a time that you even couldn't send text messages, believe it or not. And you would have to sometimes write letters to people. Have you ever written a letter? Probably you haven't, right? The young people, you may not have done that. But uh, what you do is you think of somebody and you start writing on paper. And, uh, you know, that's the end of the story there. You, you write out the letter. You tell them your thoughts. You ask them how they're doing. And then you mail it to them. And about two weeks later, you get a letter back. You know, that's how that worked. You know, Writing letters is really still something that people still do today. They write little cards and things like that. Probably one of my best memories is um, I had uh, an opportunity to go with my father-in-law 
uh, to Guyana. And so we went, and I, I enjoyed my time with him there, and, and uh, we, we had some good work. But um, my wife did something very special, and uh, she wrote me a letter and put the date on every letter. And she wrote me a letter for every day that I was going to be gone. And she had, in those letters, had mentioned you know, how she must be feeling at that moment, how she missed me, how much she loved me. And, uh, you know, I read those letters, and I threw them away when I was in Guyana. That's not true. You know that's not true. You know I didn't do that. What did I do? They're actually in my desk drawer in my office. I have kept them. And every now and then, I'll actually take those out. I'll sit all of them on the desk, and I'll make sure they're in the right order, and I will read them again. Why did I do that? I love my wife. I love her a lot. And I remember missing her and reading those letters, just the emotions I felt. I think about that a lot. And the point I want to make is this. If we love God, then we're going to pour over what he has written us. We are going to do that over and over again. You know, sometimes I've heard people say, I've had this happen to me, someone will say, I've already read that, I've already studied that, and they're talking about the Bible, and I'm thinking, you just don't love God. You love God. You're going to read it all the time. You're going to study it every opportunity that you get. You're going to do that every single opportunity because you love God. You know what, um, when it comes to our lifestyle, not only do we need to live by the book, but you know we, we just need to think about living righteously in general. In Titus 2, verses 11 and 12, it says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Here's a question. Can people tell that we are Christians? Can they tell that we are Christians? They should be able to. Uh, unfortunately, I was um, right out of preaching school. I preached for a small congregation, and, and I was uh, talking to one of the men there, and, and he was really growing while we were there. I was really impressed. It was my first time to see uh, someone who was uh, much older than me. It could have been my grandfather, and uh, he, was, he was growing, and I mean growing really well. And, and one day he came up after, after services, and he said, I've got to tell you a story. Um, so I, I listened, and, and he said, um, so I was at work the other day, and I've been listening, and I've been studying, and I've been thinking, you know what? I have never talk to anybody really about the Bible. Sure, I've talked to somebody, you know, in, in the church building, someone who's already a brethren, but, you know, I, I've, I've never done that. I've never talked to anybody. And so he said, I, I decided I was going to talk to one of my coworkers, one of my best friends at work. And so we start talking, and I tell him about, you know, the scriptures. I'm trying to invite him to worship and hoping that I could bring him to meet you and we could have a Bible study. And, and, um, and once I, he said, well, where do you go? And I told him, he goes, I'm a member of the Church of Christ too. And we had known each other for over 20 years. And he said that he was so excited and all of a sudden I was so ashamed. For 20 years, he said, I worked with this man, and I never knew he was a Christian, and he never knew I was a Christian. He said, what does that say about me? Brethren, people need to be able to tell that we're Christians by the way that we live. All right, last but not least. If everyone in the church were just like me concerning how I love, how loving would the church be? Now, I've got to make mention of some things here because I know that um, I've had people come up to me and say, you know, uh, uh, look, 
You know, we, 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 we've, we have people that say, it's all about love. And then we'll have people over here that says, it's all, all about justice. And, and um, now I don't think either one of those positions is right. No, I, I, I believe that God is just and he is merciful. I believe he's both. That's clear through the scriptures. Anybody that wants to go to one side or the other is not preaching the full counsel of God. It's just not true. God is merciful, but he's also just. Now, when God has told us how to live, and we talk about this merciful aspect, that's when people want to preach love all the time. And I love preaching about love. I know that there are certain things. See, you know, I want to preach about heaven, but I also know that there's a hell and I need to preach about hell. If I don't preach about both of those things, I'm not preaching the full counsel of God. But that being said, that explanation given, how do we love? Are we loving people? In Romans chapter 12 and verse 10, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor giving preference one to another. Or 1 Peter 1 and verse 22, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren, love one another with a pure heart fervently. Or 1 John 4 and verse 21, and this commandment we have from him that he who loves God must love his brother also. Or 1 John 3, verses 14 through 19, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. A lot of passages right there about loving each other. Now, I hope nobody is in here like this. And if there is someone, just know, I don't even know who you are, so I'm not picking on you. But I have seen some brethren that seemed like they were not happy to even be a Christian. They didn't like to be around the brethren. And they're the kind of people that you think, well, they must have been weaned on a sour pickle, you know. They're just, a, just a, not very fun to be around. We, we can't act like that toward each other. We've got to love each other. You know what? If we don't love each other, just like we saw in this last passage, how does the love of God abide in a person who does not love his brother? And the answer is the love of God does not abide in that person. What is our attitude of love toward each other? And one of the verses we mentioned, we need to prefer one another. Do we prefer each other? Or would we rather spend time with people of the world? How do we feel about that? If everyone in the church were just like me and you concerning love, how loving would this congregation be? Would it be so loving that everybody just loved coming here? You, people passing through town. Maybe people from Katy, Texas decide to come back through sometime and they want to just come and stop in at the most loving congregation they've ever been to. But you've got to answer that question honestly. If everyone in the church loved just like I do, what would the church be like? I'm going to speak directly to the men. If everyone in the church were just like me, would there even be elders? Would there men be qualified to be elders? Would there be deacons? Would there be preachers? Would there be teachers? Would there be anybody that would deal in the word of God? If everybody were just like me, what would happen? Would there be people to even preside on the Lord's table or say a prayer? What would happen? 
Would there be anybody even willing to get up and just read some scripture? If everybody in the church were just like me, where would the church be in all these leadership positions? Let me speak to the women here. Women, if everybody in the church were just like you, would there be Bible class teachers? Would there be women's classes? Would there be ladies' days? Would you help a man qualify to be an elder or deacon? Would you have faithful children? If everybody in the church were just like you, would there, there be that? Here's another question. Would this congregation exist? Would the church exist? Would there be perfect attendance? You know, I've oftentimes been asked that question. How many members are a part of the congregation wherever you preach? And you'll give out a number, but you know what we do? We'll say, well, our Sunday morning attendance is this. Or maybe our Sunday night attendance is this, but if we had everybody, it would be this, but we typically don't have everybody. Now, I, I know that some people might be sick frequently, and we're not going to get everybody, but there are people who will not show up, and you know it. If everybody in the church were just like me, would we come together and worship God with a pure heart? If everybody in the church were just like me, would there be so much money in the budget that we'd have to send tons of money overseas to foreign uh, mission fields? If everybody in the church were just like me, would everyone in this community know exactly what this congregation was expecting from people? And because, uh, you know, because of this, they know you because you've knocked on their door or something along that lines. If everybody in the church were just like me, would my lifestyle be becoming of a Christian and be a great example in the community? Here's a question. If everybody in the church were just like me, how willing would they be to obey the gospel? The plan of salvation is very simple. We need to hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized into Christ, and then live faithfully. That's what we all have to do. Maybe you have not yet been baptized into Christ. If you haven't, today is your day. You can take advantage of this tonight. If you've not studied enough, you don't know what you need to do, we'll sit down and study with you. They've got plenty of people around that can do just that. But if you are a Christian and you've listened to this lesson and you know that you need to make things right, make it right tonight. Don't leave without having done that. If it's something in a private nature, then take care of it privately. If it's something in a public nature, then take care of it by responding to the invitation. This invitation is for you. If there's anybody that needs it, please come as we stand and as we sing.